worship service. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
go into the house of the Lord, our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. For in my course better than a thousand, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Those who be in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Blessed are they that dwell in the house, Lord. I have loved thy habitation, the place where thy honor dwelt. For the Lord is his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make the joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth sings praises. Singing praises unto the Lord this morning, we will sing the opening hymn. Hymn number 272, Pass me not, O gentle Savior.
hear our humble cry. While the numbers that are calling, Lord, we call on you this morning because there is no other help that we know. We thank you, O oh Lord, for, first of all, O oh Lord, for allowing us to open our eyes this morning to be able to be in a portion of health and strength and in our right mind, to be able to venture out to your house of worship and praise. And for that, O oh Lord, we say thank you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your goodness and your mercy that you show us each and every day, O oh Lord. And sometimes we fall a little short, oh Lord, to give you all the praise and honor that you deserve. So we pause right now, oh Lord. We say thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on Calvary for such a sinner as we are. Oh Lord, be with us as we enter into this worship service, oh Lord. Come be with us and let your Holy Spirit dwell with us this morning, O oh Lord. Let your presence permeate the sanctuary, O oh Lord. Oh God, we can't thank you enough for your goodness and your mercy and all that you've done for us each and every day. Be with each and every person that is under the sound of my voice this morning, whether they're here in person, O oh Lord, or watching us virtually, O oh Lord. We just ask that you bless them and whatever they stand in need of, oh Lord, we just ask that you would provide for them. And now, Lord, in these and other blessings, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
scripture reading for this morning, and in your bulletins, it says Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, but we will not be reading from Ezekiel this morning. We'll be reading Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 20. And I will be reading out of the NIV. If you don't have your Bibles with you or your smartphone, there's a Bible. should be a Bible in front of the people. And when you found it, would you please rise? We will read in unison this morning. That's Job, the first chapter. Verses 13 through 20. Amen. Amen. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Satans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who, who has escaped to tell you. While they were still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell them. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. When, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you all together. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head, and then he fell to ground for worship and said. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Amen. From all that dwell below the skies.
Take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Whether you're here with us in person or joining us virtually online, we thank you for choosing to worship with St. Andrews this morning. Please remember those who are unable to be with us this morning and keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And if you can, give them a call or a visit this week just to show that someone cares. St. Andrews here. All right. So uh, this morning I want to start off by saying it is the Third Connectional's Purple Sunday. So what is Purple Sunday and why are we wearing these purple ribbons? I can answer that. All right. So, <laughs> The Alzheimer's Association has partnered with the African Methodist Episcopal Church to raise awareness of Alzheimer's disease amongst the African American community. Purple Sunday is designed to educate members of the faith community about Alzheimer's and other dementias. Attendees will learn about the impact of Alzheimer's disease in our community, how to re uh, recognize the signs of Alzheimer's, um, the importance of early detection and how to access care and support resources offered by the Alzheimer's Association. All that will be discussed uh, during the uh, 1 p.m. Uh, virtual program that the Connectional will be hosting via Zoom. And for to get more information on it, there is a QR code located in your bulletin along with the website to where you can register for it to get that Zoom link. And if you are joining us virtually, it was in the Wednesday announcements that were sent out. So on to our announcements and some upcoming events that we want you to make sure that are on your calendar. So after a three-year hiatus, we are excited to announce the St. Andrew's Easter program is back. Sunday, April 9th, during the 10.30 morning worship service. And if you would like to participate, please see uh, Ms. Manis or Ms. Patrice. We are practicing every Saturday, so please make sure, parents, aunties, uncles, that you please bring your uh, participants to the practices. If I can make one announcement, we will be practicing upstairs right after service. For those of you that are in uh, theaters, readers, Lawbreakers. Park, and anyone else that wants to come up and rehearse your park, right after service upstairs. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Um, all right, and then on April, and then following uh, the performance on April 9th, uh, Easter egg hunt will be held um, across the street in the park. Please come, uh, bring your family, bring your friends, so that they can partake in this wonderful uh, worship service program. St. Andrews will be hosting the Monty Thursday worship service this year on April 6th at 7 p.m. Our uh, pastor who will be bringing the message will be Reverend Dr. Brandon Fisher uh, from Kyle Temple AME Zion Church. Please join St. Andrews every Wednesday at 6 p.m. via Zoom this Lent season as we seek insight from Dr. Howard Thurman and his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, with a particular devotion on Jesus, fear, deception, hate, and love. This Wednesday, March 22nd, uh, we'll be going over chapter four, hate, um, and Reverend Renita Green will be uh, facilitating the discussion. Okay. That's all for this morning's announcements. I have not read everything word for word throughout the bulletin or um, your throughout the bulletin, so please make sure that you take your bulletins home, read it from cover to cover, and also stay tuned for those Wednesday email uh, announcements from the church. All right, do we have any visitors this morning? If so, please stand and tell us your name and where you're visiting from. My dear friend Christiana Singh is here visiting me. She's a friend from residency, and so I'm super happy that she is here. Amen. I'm super happy to be here and uh, happy to be invited by my dear friend Sydney. And I uh, was proud of her playing the piano. I've known her to play actually, and she's amazing. Yes. 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 
welcome. To our guests, we greet you in his name and are blessed by your presence with us today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Are there any, anybody celebrating their birthday this week? If so, please stand.
happy to praise the Lord at any time. And if God has been good to you in any kind of way, you need to give him a little bit more than that. Wrongdoing. 
I want to preach to you today from the thought, how to deal with disappointment, disillusionment, and disaster. Yeah. Certainly not my intent to be before you long, uh, but I want you, to, I want you to consider some things. Of course, this is a very uh, familiar passage of Scripture. If you spend any time in church, uh, you've heard the story of Job. Yeah. And you've heard it from a, from a bunch of different perspectives, I'm sure. Uh, it talks about the tremendous trials and tribulations experienced by Job as a result of what I would characterize as a bet between the Lord and Satan. Yes. The text tells us many things regarding Job's calamities. However, I will represent to you the following. That the real story is not the tribulations of Job. But the real story is that it, it is how Job responded Amen. To, Amen. The to the cataclysm events. Job's situation is what we would call full of drama, yeah. right? As we read through the passage, he gets some bad news, and before he could, the, the message of the first part of bad news comes along, then some more bad news. And then it simply compounds upon itself until Job looks up and he has nothing. He has his wife, he doesn't have his children anymore, his wealth is gone. He's in a tough, tough, situation, right? I mean, Job's situation is really something that comes right out of Hollywood Central Casting when you can see the <laughs> devastation that's heaped upon him all in one day, right? The text tells us that he lost his family and all of his possessions. And all of these things happen to Job without warning. I want you to think about that for a moment. Without warning. How many of us have lived long enough to have a cataclysmic event happen to us without warning? Something happened at work, you got a pink slip. You got a phone call and a member of your family passed away. Uh, if you've been in a marital situation and it dissolved, somebody came to you one day and said they won't be bothered with you no more. Or you said it to them. Amen? Right? But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know, all of these happen, all these things happen without without warning, and it happens to us in our daily living. This word tells us also, though, that Job was an upright and righteous man, that he was a man of vast wealth and material possession, and he was a man who revered the Lord. Yet he was a man who became afflicted through no fault of his own. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, as you are enduring your various situations, conditions, and calamities, understand that it, uh, it's not always your fault. That's right. You didn't have to have anything to do with it for it to go bad for you. People will make decisions about you for you that are not good for you, not good to you, but they happen. But they happen, right? And so you have to ask yourself, do you remember a time in your life when the unthinkable or the unexpected happened to you? See, worthy of your consideration is the fact that people can and do make decisions about you without your knowledge. Right? And like Job, you may find that the decisions made about you are not always in your best interest. They're not always good to you, though some of those decisions can be good for you. But if you can hold out long enough to get the lesson contained in the trial and tribulation, right, you might be all right. So I would, I would, I would admonish you today and simply encourage you to say, Lord, help me to hold out. Right? I want you to consider your personal situation. All of us have had or will have a Job experience in our lifetime. As the old folk used to say, baby, just keep on living. Yeah. Something is going to happen, right? And I can guarantee you that one or a number of things will occur in your life that will sometimes make you wonder if life itself is such a wonderful proposition. Now, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm being real with myself today. I've had some days where I'm like, you know, Maybe I'd just be better off in hell than I am down here today, right? Not that I'm going to do something to myself to get there, but still wondering, is it worth staying down here? See, humanly speaking, uh, people ask themselves questions when they're in the midst of a personal H-E double toothpicks, otherwise known as AIDS. You see, my brothers and my sisters, being a mature Christian does not exempt you from the vagaries of life. Yes. And it doesn't exempt you from bad things happening to you. That's right. Bad things happen to good people all the time. Yes. And we see good things happening for bad people all the time. Yes. 
if you've lived and paid attention to what's been going on over the last four to six years, yeah. you've seen a lot of good things happen to a lot of bad people. Yeah. And you wonder, are you going to get your turn, right, to get the good part for you, right? But I want you to, I want you to, to, to pay attention to a couple of things. I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. First of all, time and chance happens to all of us. Time and chance happens to all of us, and the Lord knows reign over just and the unjust, right? But also pay attention to this in the text. Job didn't ask why. He did not ask why. Now, when we are in a predicament, in a conundrum, in a situation, the first thing we do, Lord, why? Why didn't you send it just a little to the right? Why didn't you let it go down the street? Why did it have to come to my address, my place of work, or call on my family? But Job didn't ask any of these things, right? Job didn't murmur, he didn't complain, he didn't moan. What Job did was eight different things when he was dealing with his disappointment, his disillusionment, and his disasters, okay? And before we talk about, well, before we talk about these three Ds, we have to establish the fact that the Ds actually occurred, right? The text tells us that Job experienced four devastating events in one day. Yes. That will make you disillusioned, yes. right? Yes. First was the raid by the saviors. Yes. <clears throat> Second was the great fire, <clears throat> excuse me, from heaven that consumed the members of his family and a portion of his livestock. Third was the raid by the Chaldeans. Fourth and finally was the weather in the form of a wind that caused the home of his eldest child to collapse and kill all of the inhabitants, yes. right? In a nutshell, Job experienced the loss of property and the loss of life, albeit indirectly, and the loss of health, as well as the loss of wealth. My brothers and my sisters, what we would say is that, is that Job had one Hades of a day. Some of us have lost homes, cars, and jobs, and some of us have experienced all of these things in one day. The difference between most people and Job is the response to the cataclysmic events. And I believe that we can agree with the statement that not everyone can stay calm, not everyone can maintain composure, and not everyone can hang when life turns in on you and it's not friendly. Amen? Amen. In our minds, the enormity of our situation can and does uh, qualify as an unmitigated disaster. Amen? Amen? Amen. And I can tell you, if I had been Joel, I would have been disappointed with the loss of my stuff. <laughs> Just my stuff. Yeah. I worked hard yeah. to get this stuff. Yeah. Right? And I feel good <laughs> wearing some of my stuff. Yeah. I like driving yeah. my nice stuff. And when I put the key in the door, I like walking into my house seeing all of my nice stuff. So now something happens and now all my stuff is gone. Yeah, I'm just a little bit disappointed. Yeah. I'm a little bit disillusioned, right? Because after all, as human beings, we take great pride in what we believe is our ability to accumulate. Our stuff is how we keep score. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Our stuff is how we keep score. Young folk. Certain, certain tennis shoes. A certain brand on your jeans. A certain type of cell phone, all stuff, right? And this is how we this is how we keep score. Possessions are humans' way of keeping score. And your while your disaster may not be Joe's disaster, your your disaster may not be the loss of your home. In addition to your family, it could be the dissolution of a relationship, a marriage. It could be the loss of a child or children to a life that does not glorify God, right? It could be a terrible conflagration that happens in your church, your community your place of work, it could be a natural disaster. Was anybody affected or know somebody that was affected by the weather? By the floods, right? It even affected us down there in Stockton. Yeah, yeah, came home one day, pulled in the driveway, like this, with this much water. Not in the driveway, coming from the garage out. <laughs> right, very, 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 very different kind of circumstance. Whatever that disaster is, I would, rec I would, I would represent that, that, that you would be disillusioned, meaning that you're wondering why it happened to you. 
And in the midst of all of this, somewhere, someone expects you, us, to keep our cool and to deal with the mess we find ourselves in. So what do we do? How do we respond? What are we to say? And what are we to think? Well, I call Job to the witness stand. He's already been sworn in, amen? Yeah. And our brother Job gives us a tutorial in how to respond in crisis. As you look at your text, you have to ask yourself, what did Job do, right? What actions did he take, right? What did he say? What did he think during these catastrophic events? And what, what, have, what, have, you, what have you had as, in terms of your most recent Job experience? What did you do? What actions did you take? Well, the key to the entire story is actually found in verse 20, but we're going to work our way up to it, and I promise I won't be long. Job did eight things. First thing Job did is he arose. Second thing he did is he rent his mantle. The third thing he did is he shaved his head. Fourth thing he did is he fell down, and then he worshipped. Then he said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job sinned not, nor charge, charge God foolishly. So the first thing Job did after he got all of this terrible news is he got up. That means Job changed his position. He changed his position. And sometimes when you're in a catastrophic, calamitous, situation, circumstance, all you can do is change your position. Amen. And sometimes the best thing for you to do is change your position. Amen. If you're in a flood situation and you're down low, they tell you to move up high. Yeah. Right? You have to change your position. Right? So this means that Job got up. And like God the Father in an instance and Jesus at the same after Job's situation, he took action. But what did Job do after that? Then Job tore up. He rent his mantle. Mantle meaning that he tore his clothing. Now, for all of you biblical scholars, we've taken a little bit of time to understand some of the Old, Old Testament texts. Rent means to tear, but it is also a form of grieving. So he immediately grieved. He changed his position and then he grieved. Not he grieved to change his position. He changed his position and then he grieved. Very, very, very important sequence of steps. You, you, you all do understand that our God is a God of order, he is a God of sequence, right? right. So Job grieved, meaning that it's all right when you have a bad situation to grieve. Yeah. And can't nobody tell you how to grieve, That's and can't right. nobody tell you how long to grieve. That's, right. That's between you and the Lord. Right. And if the folk around you don't like your grieving, kind of ask them to leave your presence. All right. All right. right? He grieved, just as Jesus, Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. But guess what else Job did? Job shaved his head, which means Job got himself cleaned up. He shaved his head. Why? Because he was getting ready to go and worship God. He wanted to present himself in as clean a fashion as he possibly could. Right? So he changed his position. Right? He grieved, and then he got ready to go worship. Right? He cleaned himself up, just as Jesus did. Right? He's preparing himself to go before God and grieve. But I don't want you to miss this part. Job humbled himself in his circumstance and he offered praise and worship to God. This means that, that Job set up praises even in the midst of his suffering. How many of you can set up praises in the midst of your suffering? It's easy to praise God when things are going well. It's easy to praise God when you got all of your stuff. It's easy to praise God when the sun is shining outside and on you. But let those dark clouds come. Yeah. Let that rain start falling on you in a near incessant fashion. Let's see how mature you are and how much praise you have in you. Yeah. Job gives us an example of what we ought to do when things have gone bad for us. Right? See, it takes a mature Christian to praise their way through the tribulations. But guess what? When Job finished worshiping the Lord, then he proclaimed, meaning that he talked up the Lord. Right? Yes, things were bad. Yes, my family is gone. Yes, I'm no longer the wealthiest man in the East. He was probably the brokest man in the East after God got through with all of what had happened that day. Because the word tells you that he lost everything. 
And this was the man, this was a man who had thousands of cattle. Thousands of camels, right? You do understand the camels were the transportation. They were the 18 wheelers of the day. They were, right? They were the they were the trains of the day. They were the caravans of the day, and they moved goods and services. So understand this: that when when you are impacted, when you are affected, when God takes away everything from you, it doesn't just affect you. Job's calamity had a wider impact on the world around him. First of all, the camels were gone. That means that people who were depending on goods and services couldn't get them in a timely fashion because at least one set of 18 weeks was gone. Right? Job didn't allow his situation, his loss, or his overall condition to override his mouth nor his brain. This was a man who was in control. And it, again, it takes a lot of maturity to be in control when you've lost all of your stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How many mothers do I have out, out, out there? In front of me and behind me. Mamas. If you were to lose one of your children. Daddies. How many daddies I got out there? Daddies. If you were to lose one of your children. If you were to lose your spouse. If you were to lose your boo fan. Right? What kind of self-control do you think you would have? Very little, if any. Yet, the text shows us that Job stayed in control. His focus was on God the entire way. He grieved, he changed his position, and he got himself ready to go worship God in the midst of his calamity. Right? And, and, and check this out, too. Job, had, Job effectively managed his thought life and he effectively managed his tongue. He did not allow his situation, his loss, or his overall condition to override his mouth nor his brain. Yes, yes. Again, he was in control. The book of James tells us about the power of the tongue contained therein and that it's full of poison and it's deadly and it can tear down. Right. And we see like we use it more to tear down than we use it to build up. Yes. Right? Yes. Job didn't use his tongue to tear anything down. Job talked up the law. Oh, y'all not sure about that. Okay, let, me, let me take you back. 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 He said, then Job rose, rent his mouth, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and worshiped. Yes. And he said, naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return to them. The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. Bless him. Bless him. That's Job talking it up, even in the midst of all that he's lost. Yes. Can you bless God in the midst of your calamity? Can you bless God in the midst of your circumstance? Can you bless God when you've lost everything? Mm -hmm. You would be challenged to do so. You would be challenged to do so. Yet, you have a biblical example of what to do. Right? You have a biblical example of what to do. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, you have to manage your thought life. You have to manage your tone. You have to pay attention to the circumstances around you, yes. right? And you have to know that your circumstance too is going to change. Amen. And while it doesn't change in this particular passage of scripture, if you continue to read on through the book, oh, it tells you later on yeah. that Job was blessed double for his trouble. Yeah. 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 He was blessed double for his trouble. Yeah. Right. But he was tested before the tremendous blessings came upon him, right? Yeah. And so when you stop and think about that, when you stop and think about that, he was already the wealthiest man in the East before the trouble hit. He became the wealthiest man in the East in one day. Right. And then when it all turned back around, he was blessed double. Yeah. He got twice the, twice the 18 wheels, <laughs> twice the cattle, and I'm just going to assume, even though it doesn't call it out, but he said, the Bible says he was blessed double. That means he got twice, twice the children. <laughs> 20 kids. <laughs> Amen. 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 Right? And so, and so what you have to understand is that, what you have to understand is that we can't overemphasize the importance of holding your tongue and controlling your thoughts when you're in a tough situation. A wrong thought or statement can cause you far more harm than good even in, your, in, in the midst of your calamity, 
right? That's why they tell you, don't panic. Stay calm. Pay attention to what's going on around you, right? Because while it's going on, that means that something else could very well be coming. And if you're not of sound mind, if you're not paying attention, your mouth is open, you're hollering away the national yeah. teeth. Yes. You may miss it. You may yeah. miss making a critical decision that could actually better in, uh, inform your outcome. Yes. So it's extremely important, right? Extremely important that we keep our mind, right? Yeah. And so I ask these questions as I get ready to go to my seat. Mm -hmm. Are you one who knows how to go before the law? Are you one who knows how and when to worship the Lord? Are you one who knows how to praise the Lord? Are you one who knows how to talk of the Lord? Do you know how to be quiet in the Lord's presence? And do you know how to honor God when you're in his presence? And then lastly, I'll leave you with these three thoughts. Can you get up? Can you tear up? It's actually more than three. Can you clean up? Can you send up? Can you talk up? At the end of the day, do you know how to deal with your dis disappointment, your disillusionment, your death and disaster? Will you hang with the Lord as the Lord is home for you and home with you? Yes. Some of y'all didn't catch that. Yes. The Lord is home for you yes. and still hangs with you, right? Or will you fall apart when you're faced with disappointment, disillusionment, death, or disaster? Or lastly, when you follow Job's example, which is to endure, to praise, and to persevere. Amen. That's all I got. Thank you. 
church in the presence of his glory will rejoice. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the glory, majesty, power, and authority for all time and now and forever. And all God's people said,